Chapter Eight of Clover. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Clover by Susan Coolidge. Chapter Eight, High Valley. Clover was putting Phil's chamber to rights and turning it into a sitting room for the day which was always her first task in the morning. They had been at St. Helens nearly three weeks now, and the place had taken on a very home-like appearance. All the books and the photographs were unpacked, the washstand had vanished behind a screen made of a three-leaved clothes frame draped with chintz, while a ruffled cover of the same gay chintz, on which bunches of crimson and pink geraniums straggled over a cream-coloured ground, gave to the narrow bed the air of a respectable wide sofa. "'There, those look very nice, I think,' she said, giving the last touch to a bowl full of beautiful garden roses. "'How sweet they are!' "'Your young man seems rather clever about roses,' remarked Phil, who, boy-like, dearly loved to tease his sister. "'My young man, as you call him, has a father with a gardener, replied Clover calmly. No very brilliant cleverness is required for that. In a cordial, kindly place like St. Helens, people soon make acquaintances, and Clover and Phil felt as if they already knew half the people in the town. Everyone had come to see them, and deluged them with flowers and invitations to dine, to drive, to take tea. Among the rest came Mr. Thurber Wade, whom Phil was pleased to call Clover's young man, the son of a rich New York banker whose ill health had brought him to live in St. Helens and who had built a handsome house on the principal street. This gilded youth had several times sent roses to Clover, a fact which Phil had noticed and upon which he was fond of commenting. Speaking of young men, went on Clover, what do you suppose has become of Clarence Page? He said he should come in to see us soon, but that was ever so long ago. He's a fraud, I suspect, replied Phil lazily from his seat in the window. He had a geometry on his knees and was supposed to be going on with his education, but in reality he was looking at the mountains. I suppose people are pretty busy on ranches, though, he added. Perhaps they're sheep shearing. Oh, it isn't a sheep ranch. Don't you remember his saying that the cattle got very wild and they had to ride after them? They wouldn't ride after sheep. I hope he hasn't forgotten about us. I was so glad to see him. While this talk went on, Clarence was cantering down the lower end of the Ute Pass on his way to St. Helens. Three hours later, his name was brought up to them. How nice! cried Clover. I think as a relative we might let him come here, Phil. It's so much pleasanter than the parlour. Clarence, who had passed the interval of waiting in noting the different varieties of cough among the sick people in the parlour, was quite of her opinion. How jolly you look, was almost his first remark. I'm glad you've got a little place of your own and don't have to sit with those poor creatures downstairs all the time. It is much nicer. Some of them are getting better, though. Some of them aren't. There's one poor fellow in a reclining chair who looks badly. That's the one whose room Mrs. Watson has marked for her own. She asks him three times a day how he feels, with all the solicitude of a mother, said Phil. Who's Mrs. Watson? Well, she's an old lady who is somehow fastened to us, and who considers herself our chaperone, replied Clover with a little laugh. I must introduce you by and by, but first we want a good talk all by ourselves. Now tell us why you haven't come to see us before. We have been hoping for you every day. Well, I've wanted to come badly enough, but there has been a combination of hindrances. Two of our men got sick, so there was more to do than usual. Then Jeff had to be away four days, and almost as soon as he got back, he had bad news from home and I hated to leave him alone. 
what sort of bad news his sister's dead poor fellow in england too you said he was english didn't you yes she was married her husband was a clergyman down in cornwall somewhere she was older than jeff a good deal but he was very fond of her and the news cut him up dreadfully no wonder it is horrible to hear such a thing when one is far from home observed clover she tried to realize how she should feel if word came to st helen's of katie's death or elsie's or johnny's but her mind refused to accept the question the very idea made her shiver poor fellow she said again what could you do for him clarence not much i'm a poor hand at comforting any one men generally are i guess jeff knows i'm sorry for him but it takes a woman to say the right thing at such times we sit and smoke when the work's done and i know what he's thinking about but we don't say anything to each other now let's speak of something else i want to settle about your coming to high valley high valley is that the name of your place yes i want you to see it it's an awfully pretty place to my thinking not so very much higher than this but you have to climb a good deal to get there can't you come this is just the time raspberries ripe and lots of flowers wherever the beasts don't get at them phil can have all the riding he wants and it'll do poor jeff lots of good to see someone it would be very nice indeed doubtfully but who could we get to go with us i thought of that we don't take much stock in mrs grundy out here but i supposed you'd want another lady how would it be if i asked mrs hope the doctor's got to come out anyway to see one of our herders who's put his shoulder out in a fall if he would drive you out and mrs hope would stay on would you come for a week i guess you'll like it i guess we should exclaimed clover her face lighting up clarence how delightful it sounds it will be lovely to come if mrs hope says yes then that's all right replied clarence looking extremely pleased i'll ride up to the doctor's as soon as dinner's over you'll dine with us of course oh i always come to mother marsh for a bite whenever i stay over the day she likes to have me we've been great chums ever since i had fever here and she took care of me clover was amused at dinner to watch the cool deliberation with which clarence studied mrs watson and her tortuous conversation and as he would have expressed it took stock of her the result was not favourable apparently what on earth did they send that old thing with you for he asked as soon as they went upstairs she's as much out of her element here as a canary bird would be in a cyclone she can't be any use to you clover well no i don't think she is it was a sort of mistake i'll tell you about it some time but she likes to imagine that she's taking care of me and as it does no harm i let her taking care of you great thunder i wouldn't trust her to take care of a blue-eyed kitten observed the irreverent clarence well i'll ride up and settle with the hopes and stop and let you know as i come back mrs hope and the doctor were not hard to persuade in colorado people keep their lamps of enjoyment filled and trimmed so to speak and their travelling energies ready girt about them and easily adopt any plan which promises pleasure the following day was fixed for the start and clover packed her valise and phil's bag with a sense of exhilaration and escape she was in truth getting very tired of the exactions of mrs watson mrs watson on her part did not at all approve of the excursion i think she said swelling with offended dignity that your cousin didn't know much about politeness when he left me out of his invitation and asked mrs hope instead yes i know the doctor had to go up anyway that may be true and it may not but it doesn't alter the case what am i to do i should like to know 
if the valves of my heart don't open or don't shut whichever it is while i'm left all alone here among strangers send for dr hope suggested phil he'll only be gone one night clover doesn't know anything about valves my cousin lives in a rather rough way i imagine interposed clover with a reproving look at phil he would hardly like to ask a stranger and an invalid to his house where he might not be able to make her comfortable mrs hope has been there before and she's an old friend oh i dare say there are always reasons i don't say i should have felt like going but he ought to have asked me ellen will be surprised and so will he's from ashburn too and he must know the palmenters and mrs palmenter's brother's son is partner to henry's brother-in-law it is of no consequence of course still respect older people boston not used to phillips mrs watson's voice died away into fragmentary and inaudible lamentings clover attempted no further excuse her good sense told her that she had a perfect right to accept this little pleasure that mrs watson's plans for western travel had been formed quite independently of their own and that papa would not wish her to sacrifice herself and phil to such unreasonable humours still it was not pleasant and i am sorry to say that from this time dated a change of feeling on mrs watson's part toward her young friends she took up a chronic position of grievance toward them confided her wrong to all newcomers and met clover with an offended air which though clover ignored it did not add to the happiness of her life at mrs marsh's it was early in the afternoon when they started and the sun was just dipping behind the mountain wall when they drove into the high valley it was one of those natural parks four miles long which lie like heaven-planted gardens among the colorado ranges the richest of grass clothed it fine trees grew in clumps and clusters here and there and the spaces about the house where fences of barbed wire defended the grass from the cattle seemed a carpet of wild flowers clover exclaimed with delight at the view the ranges which lapped and held the high sheltered upland in embrace opened towards the south and revealed a splendid lonely peak on whose summit a drift of freshly fallen snow was lying the contrast with the verdure and bloom below was charming the cabin it was little more stood facing this view and was backed by a group of noble red cedars it was built of logs long and low with a rude porch in front supported on unbarked tree trunks two fine collies rushed to meet them barking vociferously and at the sound clarence hurried to the door he met them with great enthusiasm lifted out mrs hope then clover and then began shouting for his chum who was inside hello jeff where are you hurry up they've come then as he appeared ladies and gentlemen my partner geoffrey templestowe was a tall sinewy young englishman with ruddy hair and beard grave blue eyes and an unmistakable air of good breeding he wore a blue flannel shirt and high boots like clarence's yet somehow he made clarence look a little rough and undistinguished he was quiet in speech reserved in manner and seemed depressed and under a cloud but clover liked his face at once he looked both strong and kind she thought the house consisted of one large square room in the middle which served as parlour and dining-room both and on either side two bedrooms the kitchen was in a separate building there was no lack of comfort though things were rather rude and the place had a bare masculine look the floor was strewn with coyote and fox skins two or three easy chairs stood around the fireplace in which july as it was a big log was blazing their covers were shabby and worn but they looked comfortable and were evidently in constant use there was not the least attempt at prettiness anywhere pipes and books and old newspapers 
littered the chairs and tables. When an extra seat was needed, Clarence simply tipped a great pile of these onto the floor. A gun rack hung upon the wall, together with sundry long stock whips and two or three pairs of spurs, and a smell of tobacco pervaded the place. Clover's eyes wandered to a corner where stood a small parlour organ, and over it a shelf of books. She rose to examine them. To her surprise, they were all hymnals and Church of England prayer books. There were no others. She wondered what it meant. Clarence had given up his own bedroom to Phil, and was to chum with his friend. Some little attempt had been made to adorn the rooms which were meant for the ladies. Clean towels had been spread over the pine shelves, which did duty for dressing tables, and on each stood a tumbler stuffed as full as it could hold with purple penstemons. Clover could not help laughing, yet there was something pathetic to her in the clumsy, man-like arrangement. She relieved the tumbler by putting a few of the flowers in her dress, and went out again to the parlour, where Mrs. Hope sat by the fire, quizzing the two partners, who were hard at work setting their tea-table. It was rather a droll spectacle, the two muscular young fellows creaking to and fro in their heavy boots, and taking such an infinitude of pains with their operations. One would set a plate on the table, and the other would forthwith alter its position slightly, or lift and scrutinise a tumbler, and dust it sedulously with a glass towel. Each spoon was polished with the greatest particularity before it was laid on the tray. Each knife passed under inspection. Visitors were not an everyday luxury in the High Valley, and too much care could not be taken for their entertainment, it seemed. Supper was brought in by a Chinese cook in a pigtail, wooden shoes, and a blue Mother Hubbard, Chu Lu by name. He was evidently a good cook for the cornbread and fresh mountain trout and the ham and eggs were savoury to the last degree, and the flapjacks, with which the meal concluded, and which were eaten with a sauce of melted raspberry jelly, deserved even higher encomium. "'We're willing to be treated as company this first night,' observed Mrs. Hope, "'but if you are going to keep us for a week, you must let us make ourselves useful, and set the table.' and arrange the rooms for you. "'We will begin tomorrow morning,' added Clover. "'May we, Clarence? May we play that it is our house, and do what we like, and change about and arrange things? It will be such fun!' "'Far away,' said her cousin calmly. "'The more you change, the more we shall like it. Jeff and I aren't set in our ways, and are glad enough to be let off duty for a week.' The hut is yours just as long as you will stay. Do just what you like with it. Though we're pretty good housekeepers, too, considering. Don't you think so? Do you believe he meant it? asked Clover, confidentially afterward of Mrs. Hope. Do you think they really wouldn't mind being tidied up a little? I should so like to give that room a good dusting, if it wouldn't vex them. My dear, they will probably never know the difference except by a vague sense of improved comfort. Men are dreadfully untidy, as a general thing, when left to themselves, but they like very well to have other people make things neat. Mr. Templestowe told Phil that they go off early in the morning, and don't come back till breakfast at half-past seven, so if I wake early enough, I shall try to do a little setting to rights before they come in. And I'll come and help if I don't oversleep, declared Mrs. Hope. "'but this air makes me feel dreadfully as if I should.' "'I shan't call you,' said Clover, "'but it will be nice to have you if you come.' She stood at her window after Mrs. Hope had gone, for a last look at the peak which glittered sharply in the light of the moon. The air was like scented wine. She drew a long breath. "'How lovely it is,' she said to herself and kissed her hand to the mountain. Good night, you beautiful thing. She woke with the first beam of yellow sun, after eight hours of dreamless sleep, with a keen sense of renovation and refreshment. 
a great splashing was going on in the opposite wing, and manly voices hushed to suppressed tones were audible. Then came a sound of boots on the porch, and peeping from behind her curtain, she saw Clarence and his friend striding across the grass in the direction of the stock huts. She glanced at her watch. It was a quarter past five. Now is my chance, she thought, and dressing rapidly, she put on a little cambric jacket, knotted her hair up, tied a handkerchief over it, and hurried into the sitting-room. Her first act was to throw open all the windows, to let out the smell of stale tobacco, her next to hunt for a broom. She found one at last, hanging on the door of a sort of store-closet, and moving the furniture as noiselessly as she could, she gave the room a rapid but effectual sweeping. While the dust settled, she stole out to a place on the hillside where the night before she had noticed some mariposa lilies growing, and gathered a large bunch. Then she proceeded to dust and straighten, sorted out the newspapers, wiped the woodwork with a damp cloth, arranged the disorderly books, and set the breakfast table. When all this was done, there was still time to finish her toilet and put her pretty hair in its accustomed coils and waves, so that Clarence and Mr. Templestowe came in to find the fire blazing, the room bright and neat, Mrs. Hope sitting at the table in a pretty violet gingham ready to pour the coffee which Chu Lu had brought in, and Clover, the good fairy of this transformation scene, in a fresh blue muslin with a ribbon to match in her hair, just setting the mariposas in the middle of the table. Their lilac streaked bells nodded from a tall vase of ground glass. "'Oh, I say!' cried Clarence. "'This is something like. Isn't it scrumptious, Jeff? The hut never looked like this before. It's wonderful what a woman—no, two women—' with a bow to Mrs. Hope, can do toward making things pleasant. Where did that vase come from, Clover? We never owned anything so fine as that, I'm sure. It came from my bag, and it's a present for you and Mr. Templestowe. I saw it in a shop window yesterday, and it occurred to me that it might be just the thing for High Valley, and fill a gap. And Mrs. Hope has brought you each a pretty coffee cup. It was a merry meal. The pleasant look at the room, the little surprises, and the refreshment of seeing new and kindly faces, raised Mr. Templestowe's spirits, and warmed him out of his reserve. He grew cheerful and friendly. Clarence was in uproarious spirits, and Phil even worse. It seemed as if the air of the high valley had got into his head. Dr. Hope left at noon, after making a second visit to the lame herder and Mrs. Hope and Clover settled themselves for a week of enjoyment. They were alone for hours every day, while their young hosts were off on the ranch, and they devoted part of this time to various useful and decorative arts. They took all manner of liberties, poked about and rummaged, mended, sponged, assorted, and felt themselves completely mistresses of the situation. A note to Marion Chase brought up a big parcel by stage to the Ute Valley, four miles away, from which it was fetched over by a cowboy on horseback, and Clover worked away busily at scrim curtains for the windows, while Mrs. Hope shaped a slip-cover of gay chintz for the shabbiest of the armchairs, hemmed a great square of gold-coloured canton flannel for the bare, unsightly table, and made a bright red pincushion apiece for the bachelor quarters. The sitting-room took on quite a new aspect, and every added touch gave immense satisfaction to the boys, as Mrs. Hope called them, who thoroughly enjoyed the effect of these ministrations, though they had not the least idea how to produce it themselves. Creature comforts were not forgotten. The two ladies amused themselves with experiments in cookery. The herders brought a basket of wild raspberries, and Clover turned them into jam for winter use. Clarence gloated over the little white pots, and was never tired of counting them. They looked so like New England, he declared, that he felt as if he must get a girl at once, and go and walk in the graveyard. 
a pastime which he remembered as universal in his native town. Various cakes and puddings appeared to attest the industry of the housekeepers, and on the only wet evening, when a wild thunder gust was sweeping down the valley, they had a wonderful candy pool, and made enough to give all the cowboys a treat. It must not be supposed that all their time went in these domestic pursuits. No, indeed. Mrs. Hope had brought her own side-saddle, and had borrowed one for Clover. The place was full of horses, and not a day passed without a long ride up or down the valley, and into the charming little side-canyons which opened from it. A spirited bronco named Sorrel had been made over to Phil's use for the time of his stay, and he was never out of the saddle when he could help it, except to eat and sleep. He shared in the herder's wild gallops after stock, and though Clover felt nervous about the risks he ran whenever she took time to think them over, he was so very happy that she had not the heart to interfere or check his pleasure. She and Mrs. Hope rode out with a gentleman on the great day of the round-up, and, stationed at a safe point a little way up the hillside, watched the spectacle. The plunging, excited herd the cowboys madly galloping, swinging their long whips and lassoes, darting to and fro to head off refractory beasts, or check the tendency to stampede. Both Clarence and Geoffrey Templestowe were bold and expert riders, but the Mexican and Texan herders in their employ far surpassed them. The ladies had never seen anything like it. Phil and his bronco were in the midst of things, of course, and had one or two tumbles, but nothing to hurt them. Only Clover was very thankful when it was all safely over. In their rides and scrambling walks, it generally happened that Clarence took possession of Clover, and left Jeff in charge of Mrs. Hope. Cousinship and old friendship gave him a right, he considered, and he certainly took full advantage of it. Clover liked Clarence, but there were moments when she felt she would rather enjoy the chance to talk more with Mr. Templestowe, and there was a look in his eyes now and then which seemed to say that he might enjoy it too. But Clarence did not observe this look, and he had no idea of sharing his favourite cousin with anyone if he could help it. Sunday brought the explanation of the shelf full of prayer books which had puzzled them on their first arrival. There was no church within reach, and it was Jeff's regular custom, it seemed, to hold a little service for the men in the valley. Almost all of them came, except the few Mexicans who were Roman Catholics, and the room was quite full. Jeff read the service well and reverently, gave out the hymns, and played the accompaniments for them, closing with a brief bit of a sermon by the elder Arnold was all done simply and as a matter of course, and Clarence seemed to join in it with much good will. But Clover privately wondered whether the idea of doing such a thing would have entered into his head had he been left alone, or, if so, whether he would have cared enough about it to carry it out regularly. She doubted. Whatever the shortcomings of the Church of England may be, she certainly trains her children into a devout observance of Sunday. The next day, Monday, was to be their last, a fact lamented by everyone, particularly Phil, who regarded the high valley as a paradise, and would gladly have remained there for the rest of his natural life. Clover hated to take him away, but Dr. Hope had warned her privately that a week would be enough of it, and that with Phil's tendency to overdo, too long a stay would be undesirable. So she stood firm, though Clarence urged a delay, and Phil seconded the proposal with all his might. The very pleasantest moment of the visit, perhaps, came on that last afternoon, when Jeff got her to himself for once, and took her up a trail where she had not yet been, in search of scarlet pen stemmons to carry back to St. Helens. They found great sheaves of the slender stems, threaded as it were with jewel-like blossoms, but what was better still, they had a talk, and Clover felt that she had now a new friend. Jeff told her of his people at home, 
and a little about the sister who had lately died. Only a little. He could not yet trust himself to talk long about her. Clover listened with frank and gentle interest. She liked to hear about the old grange at the head of a chine above Clovelly, where Jeff was born, and which had once been full of boys and girls, now scattered in the English fashion to all parts of the world. There was Ralph with his regiment in India, he was the heir, it seemed, and Jim and Jack in Australia, and Oliver with his wife and children in New Zealand, and Alan at Harrow, and another boy fitting for the civil service. There was a married sister in Scotland, and another in London, and Isabel, the youngest of all, still at home, the light of the house, and the special pet of the old squire, and of Jeff's mother, who, he told Clover, had been a great beauty in her youth, and though nearly seventy, was in his eyes beautiful still. "'It's pretty quiet there for Isabel,' he said, "'but she has my sister Helen's two children to care for, and that will keep her busy. I used to think she'd come out to me one of these years for a twelve-month. But there's little chance of her being spared now.' Clover's sympathy did not take the form of words. It looked out of her eyes, and spoke in the hushed tones of her soft voice. Jeff felt that it was there, and it comforted him. The poor fellow was very lonely in those days, and inclined to be homesick, as even a manly man sometimes is. "'What an awful time Adam must have had of it before he came,' growled Clarence that evening, as they sat around the fire. "'He had a pretty bad time after she came, if I remember,' said Clover, laughing. "'Ah, but he had her. "'Stuff and nonsense! "'He was a long shot happier without her and her old apple, I think,' put in Phil. "'You fellows don't know when you're well off.' "'Everybody laughed. "'Phil's notion of paradise is the high valley and sorrel "'and no girls about to bother and tell him not to get too tired,' remarked Clover. "'It is a fair vision, but like all fair visions, it must end.' and end it did next day, when Dr. Hope appeared with the carriage, and the bags and saddles were put in, and the great bundle of wildflowers, with their stems tied in wet moss, and Phil, torn from his beloved Bronco, on whose back he had passed so many happy hours, was forced to accompany the others back to civilization. "'I shall see you very soon,' said Clarence, tucking the lap-robe round Clover. "'There's the mail to fetch and other things. "'I shall be riding in every day or two. "'I shall see you very soon,' said Jeff on the other side. "'Clarence is not coming without me, I can assure you.' "'Then the carriage drove away, "'and the two partners went back into the house, "'which looked suddenly empty and deserted. "'I'll tell you what,' began Clarence. "'And I'll tell you what,' rejoined Jeff. A house isn't worth a red cent which hasn't a woman in it. You might ride down and ask Miss Perkins to step up and adorn our lives, said his friend grimly. Miss Perkins was a particularly rigid spinster who taught a school six miles distant and for whom Clarence entertained a particular distaste. You be hanged! I don't mean that kind, I mean... A nice kind, like Mrs. Hope and your cousin? Well, I'm agreed. "'I shall go down after the mail tomorrow,' remarked Clarence between the puffs of his pipe. "'So shall I. All right, come along.' But though the words sounded hearty, the tone rather belied them. Clarence was a little puzzled by, and did not quite like this newborn enthusiasm on the part of his comrade. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Clover. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Clover by Susan Coleridge. Chapter 9 Over a Pass. True to their resolve, the young heads of the High Valley Ranch rode together to St. Helen's next day, 
ostensibly to get their letters, in reality to call on their late departed guests. They talked amicably as they went, but unconsciously each was watching the other's mood and speech. To like the same girl makes young men curiously observant of each other. A disappointment was in store for them. They had taken it for granted that Clover would be as disengaged and as much at their service as she had been in the valley. And lo! She sat on the piazza with a knot of girls about her, and a young man in an extremely fetching costume of snow-white duck with a flower in his buttonhole was bending over her chair and talking in a low voice of something which seemed of interest. He looked provokingly cool and comfortable to the dusty horseman, and very much at home. Phil, who lounged against the piazza rail opposite, dispensed an enormous and meaning wink at his two friends as they came up the steps. Clover jumped up from her chair and gave them a most cordial reception. "'How delightful to see you again so soon,' she said. Then she introduced them to a girl in pink and a girl in blue as Miss Purham and Miss Blanchard, and they shook hands with Marion Chase, whom they already knew, and lastly were presented to Mr. Wade, the youth in white. The three young men eyed one another with a not very friendly scrutiny, just veiled by the necessary outward politeness. "'Then you will be all ready for Thursday, and your brother too, of course, and my mother will stop for you at half-past ten on her way down,' they heard him say. "'Miss Chase will go with the hopes. Oh, yes, there will be plenty of room, no danger about that. We're almost sure to have good weather too. Good morning.' I'm so glad you enjoyed the roses. There was a splendid cluster of Jacqueminot buds in Clover's dress, at which Clarence glared wrathfully as he caught these words. The only consolation was that the creature in duck was going. He was making his last bows, and one of the girls went with him, which still farther reduced the number of what in his heart Clarence stigmatised as a crowd. I must go too said the girl in blue. Goodbye, Clover. I shall run in a minute tomorrow to talk over the last arrangements for Thursday. What's going to happen on Thursday? growled Clarence, as soon as she had departed. Oh, such a delightful thing, cried Clover, sparkling and dimpling. Old Mr. Wade, the father of young Mr. Wade, whom you saw just now, is a director on the railroad, you know, and they have given him the director's car, to take a party over the Marshall Pass, and he has asked Phil and me to go. It is such a surprise. Ever since we came to St. Helens, people have been telling us what a beautiful journey it is, but I never supposed we should have the chance to take it. Mrs. Hope is going too, and the doctor, and Miss Chase, and Miss Purham. All the people we know best, in fact. Isn't it nice?' "'Oh, certainly, very nice,' replied Clarence, in a tone of deep offence. He was most unreasonably in the sulks. Clover glanced at him with surprise, and then at Jeff, who was talking to Marion. He looked a little serious, and not so bright as in the valley, but he was making himself very pleasant, notwithstanding. Surely he had the same causes for annoyance as Clarence, but his breeding forbade him to show whatever inward vexation he may have felt, certainly not to allow it to influence his manners. Clover drew a mental contrast between the two, which was not to Clarence's advantage. "'Who's that fellow, anyway?' demanded Clarence. "'How long have you known him? What business has he to be bringing you roses and making up parties to take you off on private cars?' Something in Clover's usually soft eyes made him stop suddenly. "'I beg your pardon,' he said in an altered tone. "'I really think you should,' replied Clover, with pretty dignity. Then she moved away and began to talk to Jeff, whose grave courtesy at once warmed into cheer and sun. Clarence, thus left a prey to remorse, was wretched. He tried to catch Clover's eye, but she wouldn't look at him. 
he leaned against the balustrade, moody and miserable. Phil, who had watched these various interludes with interest, indicated his condition to Clover with another telegraphic wink. She glanced across, relented, and made Clarence a little signal to come and sit by her. After that, all went happily. Clover was honestly delighted to see her two friends again, and now that Clarence had recovered from his ill temper, there was nothing to mar their enjoyment. Jeff's horse had cast a shoe on the way down, it seemed, and must be taken to the blacksmith's, so they did not stay very long, but it was arranged that they should come back to dinner at Mrs. Marsh's. "'What a raving bell you are!' remarked Marion Chase as the young men rode away. Three is a good many at a time, though, isn't it? Three what? Three, er, uh, leaves to one clover. It's the usual allowance, I believe. If there were four now. Oh, I dare say there will be. They seem to collect round you like wasps round honey. It's some natural law, I presume. Gravitation or levitation. Which is it? I'm sure I don't know, and don't try to tease me, Poppy. People out here are so kind that it's enough to spoil anybody. Kind, forsooth! Do you consider it all pure kindness? Really, for such a bell, you are very innocent. I wish you wouldn't, protested Clover, laughing and colouring. I never was a bell in my life, and that's the second time you've called me that. Nobody ever said such things to me in Burnet. Ah! you had to come to Colorado to find out how attractive you could be. Burnett must be a very quiet place. Never mind, you shan't be teased, Clover dear. Only don't let this trefoil of yours get to fighting with one another. That good-looking cousin of yours was casting quite murderous glances at poor Thurber Wade just now. Clarence is a dear boy, but he's rather spoiled and not quite grown up yet, I think. "'When are you coming back from the Marshall Pass?' inquired Jeff after dinner, when Clarence had gone for the horses. "'On Saturday. We shall only be gone two days. "'Then I will ride in on Thursday morning, if you will permit, with my field glass. "'It is a particularly good one, and you may find it useful for the distant views.' "'When are you coming back?' demanded Clarence a little later. "'Saturday. Then I shan't be in again before Monday.' Don't you want your letters? Oh, I guess there won't be any worth coming for till then. Not a letter from your mother? She only writes once in a while. Most of what I get comes from Pa. Cousin Olivia never did seem to care much for Clarence, remarked Clover, after they were gone. He would have been a great deal nicer if he had had a pleasanter time at home. It makes such a difference with boys. Now Mr. Templestowe had a lovely mother, I'm sure. Oh, was all the reply that Phil would vouchsafe. How queer people are, thought little Clover to herself afterward. Neither of those boys quite liked our going on this expedition, I think, though I'm sure I can't imagine why, but they behaved so differently. Mr. Templestowe thought of us, and something which might give us pleasure, and Clarence only thought about himself. Poor Clarence! He never had half a chance till he came here. It isn't all his fault. The party in the director's car proved a merry one. Mrs. Wade, a jolly, motherly woman, fond of the good things of life, and delighting in making people comfortable, had spared no pains of preparation. There were quantities of easy chairs, and fans, and eau de cologne. The larder was stocked with all imaginable dainties. Iced tea, lemonade, and champagne cup flowed on the least provocation for all the hot moments, and each table was a bank of flowers. Each lady had a superb bouquet, and on the second day a great tin box of freshly cut roses met them at Pueblo, so that they came back as gaily furnished forth as they went. Having the privilege of the road, the car was attached or detached to suit their convenience, and this enabled them to command daylight for all the finest points of the excursion. First of these was the Royal Gorge, 
where the Arkansas River pours through a magnificent canyon, between precipices so steep and with curves so sharp that only engineering genius of the most daring order could, it would seem, have devised a way through. Then, after a pause at the pretty town of Salida, with the magnificent range of the Sangre de Cristo mountains in full sight, they began to mount the pass over long loops of rail, which doubled and redoubled on themselves again and again on their way to the summit. The train had been divided, and the first half with its two engines was seen at times puffing and snorting directly overhead of the second half on the lower curve. With each hundred feet of elevation, the view changed and widened. Now it was of overlapping hills, set with little mazes, like folds of green velvet flung over the rocks. Now of dim-seen valley depths, with winding links of silver rivers, and again of countless mountain peaks, sharp cut against the sunset sky, some rosy pink, some shining with snow. The flowers were a continual marvel. At the top of the pass, 11,000 feet and more above the sea, their colours and their abundance were more profuse and splendid than on the lower levels. There were whole fields of penstemons, pink, blue, royal purple, or the rare scarlet variety, like stems of asparagus strung with rubies. There were masses of gilias and of wonderful coreopsis, enormous cream-coloured stars with deep orange centres, and deep yellow ones with scarlet centres, thickets of snowy-cupped mentzelia and of wild rose, while here and there a tall red lily burned like a little lonely flame in the green, or regiments of convolvuli waved their stately heads. From below came now and again the tinkle of distant cowbells. These and the plaintive coo of morning doves in the branches, and the rush of the wind, which was like cool flower-scented wine, was all that broke the stillness of the high places. "'To think I am so much nearer heaven than when I was a boy,' misquoted Clover, as she sat on the rear platform of the car, with Poppy and Thurber Wade. "'Are you sure your head doesn't ache?' This elevation plays the mischief with some people. My mother has taken to her berth with ice on her temples. Headache? No, oh, indeed. This air is too delicious. I feel as though I could dance all the way from here to the Black Canyon. You don't look as if your head ached or anything, said Mr. Wade, staring at Clover admiringly. Her cheeks were pink with excitement, her eyes full of light and exhilaration. Oh, dear! We are beginning to go down, she cried, watching one of the beautiful peaks of the Sangre de Cristos as it dipped out of sight. I think I could find it in my heart to cry, if it were not that tomorrow we are coming up again. So down, down, down they went. Dusk slowly gathered about them, and the white-gloved butler set the little tables, and brought in broiled chicken and grilled salmon, and salad, and hot rolls and peaches, and they were all very hungry. And Clover did not cry, but fell to work on her supper with an excellent appetite, quite unconscious that they were speeding through another wonderful gorge without seeing one of its beauties. Then the car was detached from the train, and when she awoke next morning, they were at the little station called Simaro, at the head of the famous Black Canyon, with three hours to spare before the train from Utah should arrive to take them back to St. Helens. Early as it was, the small settlement was awake. Lights glanced from the eating house, where cooks were preparing breakfast for the through passengers, and smokes curled from the chimneys. Close to the car was a large brick structure which seemed to be a sort of hotel for locomotives. A number of the enormous creatures had evidently passed the night there, and just waked up. Clover now watched their antics with great amusement from her window, as their engineers ran them in and out, rubbed them down like horses, and fed them with oil and coal, while they snorted and backed and sidled a good deal as real horses do. 
Clover could not at all understand what all these manoeuvres were for. They seemed only designed to show the paces of the iron steeds, and what they were good for. "'Miss Clover,' whispered a voice outside her curtains, "'I've got hold of a hand-car and a couple of men, and don't you want to take a spin down the canyon and see the view with no smoke to spoil it? Just you and me and Miss Chase? She says she'll go if you will. Hurry and don't make a noise. We won't wake the others.' Of course Clover wanted to. She finished her dressing at top speed, hurried on her hat and jacket, stole softly out to where the others awaited her, and in five minutes they were smoothly running down the gorge, over high trestle-work bridges and round sharp curves which made her draw her breath a little faster. There was no danger, the men who managed the handcar assured them. It was a couple of hours yet before the next train came in. There was plenty of time to go three or four miles down and return. Anything more delicious than the early morning air in the Black Canyon it would be difficult to imagine. Cool, odorous with pines and with the breath of the mountains, it was like a zestful draught of iced summer. Close beside the track ran a wondrous river which seemed made of melted jewels, so curiously brilliant were its waters and mixed of so many hues. Its course among the rocks was a flash of foaming rapids, broken here and there by pools of exquisite blue-green, deepening into inky violet under the shadow of the cliffs. And such cliffs! One, two, three thousand feet high! Not deep-coloured like those about St. Helens, but of steadfast mountain hues, and of magnificent forms, buttresses and spires, crags whose bases were lost in untrodden forests, needle-sharp pinnacles like the Swiss Aguil. The morning was just making its way into the canyon, and the loftier tops flashed with yellow sun, while the rest were still in cold shadow. Breakfast was just ready when the hand-car arrived again at the upper end of the gorge, and loud were the reproaches which met the happy three as they alighted from it. Phil was particularly afflicted. "'I call it mean not to wake a fellow,' he said. "'But a fellow was so sound asleep,' said Clover. "'I really hadn't the heart. I did peep in at your curtain, and if you had moved so much as a finger, perhaps I should have called you, but you didn't.' The return journey was equally fortunate and the party reached St. Helens late in the evening of the second day, in what Mr. Wade called excellent form. Monday brought the young men from the ranch in again, and another fortnight passed happily, Clover's three leaves being most faithfully attentive to their central point of attraction. Three is a good many, as Marion Chase had said, but all girls like to be liked, and Clover did not find this, her first little experience of the kind, at all disagreeable. The excursion to the Marshall Pass, however, had an after-effect which was not so pleasant. Either the high elevation had disagreed with Phil, or he had taken a little cold. At all events, he was distinctly less well. With the lowering of his physical forces came a corresponding depression of spirits. Mrs. Watson worried him, the sick people troubled him, the sound of coughing depressed him, his appetite nagged, and his sleep was broken. Clover felt that he must have a change, and consulted Dr. Hope, who advised their going to the Ute Valley for a month. This involved giving up their rooms at Mrs. Marsh's, which was a pity, as it was by no means certain that they would be able to get them again later. Clover regretted this, but fate, as fate often does, brought a compensation. Mrs. Watson had no mind whatever for the Ute Valley. It's a dull place, they tell me, and there's nothing to do there but ride on horseback, and as I don't ride on horseback, I really don't see what use there would be in my going, she said to Clover. If I were young, and there were young men ready to ride with me all the time, it would be different, though Ellen never did care to, except with Henry, of course, after they and I can't really see that your brother's much different from what he was, though if Dr. Hope says so, 
naturally you he's a queer kind of doctor it seems to me to send lung patients up higher than this which is high already gracious knows no if you decide to go i shall just move over to the shoshone for the rest of the time that i'm here i'm sure that dr carr couldn't expect me to stay on here alone just for the chance that you may want to come back when as like as not mrs marsh won't be able to take you again oh no i'm quite sure he wouldn't only i thought doubtfully that as you've always admired phil's room so much you might like to secure it now that we have to go well yes if you were to be here i might if that man who's so sick had got better or gone away or something i dare say i should have settled down in his room and been comfortable enough but he seems just about as he was when we came so there's no use waiting and i'd rather go to the shoshone anyway i always said it was a mistake that we didn't go there in the first place it was dr hope's doing and i have not the least confidence in him he hasn't osculated me once since i came hasn't he said clover feeling her voice tremble and perfectly aware of the shaking of phil's shoulders behind her no and i don't call just putting his ear to my chest listening dr bangs at home would be ashamed to come to the house without his stethoscope i mean to move this afternoon i've given mrs marsh notice so mrs watson and her belongings went to the shoshone and clover packed the trunks with a lighter heart for her departure the last day of july found clover and phil settled in the ute park it was a wild and beautiful valley some hundreds of feet higher than st helen's and seemed the very home of peace a sunday-like quiet pervaded the place whose stillness was never broken except by bird songs and the rustle of the pine branches the sides of the valley near its opening were dotted here and there with huts and cabins belonging to parties who had fled from the heat of the plains for the summer at the upper end stood the ranch house a large rather rudely built structure and about it were a number of cabins and cottages in which two four or six people could be accommodated clover and phil were lodged in one of these the tiny structure contained only a sitting and two sleeping rooms and was very plain and bare but there was a fireplace wood was abundant so that a cheerful blaze could be had for cool evenings and the little piazza faced the south and made a sheltered sitting place on windy days one pleasant feature of the spot was its nearness to the high valley clarence and jeff templestowe thought nothing of riding four miles and scarcely a day passed when one or both did not come over they brought wild flowers or cream or freshly churned butter as offerings from the ranch and what clover valued as a greater kindness yet they brought phil's beloved bronco sorrel and arranged with the owner of the ute ranch that it should remain as long as phil was there this gave phil hours of delightful exercise every day and though sometimes he set out early in the morning for the high valley and stayed later in the afternoon than his sister thought prudent she had not the heart to chide so long as he was visibly getting better hour by hour sundays the friends spent together as a matter of course jeff waited till his little home service for the ranchman was over and then would gallop across with clarence to pass the rest of the day there was no lack of kind people at the main house and in the cottages to take an interest in the delicate boy and his sweet motherly sister so clover had an abundance of volunteer matrons and plenty of pleasant ways in which to spend those occasional days on which the high valley attaches fail to appear it was a simple healthful life the happiest on the whole which they had led since leaving home once or twice mr thurber wade made his appearance gallantly mounted and freighted with flowers and kind messages from his mother to miss carr but clover was never sorry when he rode away again somehow he did not seem to belong to the happy valley as in her heart she denominated the place there was a remarkable deal of full moon that month as it seemed at least the fact served as an excuse for a good many late transits between the valley and the park 
Now and then, either Clarence or Jeff would lead over a saddle-horse and give Clover a good gallop up or down the valley, which she always enjoyed. The habit which she had extemporised for her visit to the high valley answered very well, and Mrs. Hope had lent her a hat. On one of these occasions, she and Clarence had ridden farther than usual, quite down to the end of the pass, where the road dipped and descended to the little watering place of Canyon Creek, a Swiss-like village of hotels and lodging-houses and shops for the sale of minerals and mineral waters, set along the steep sides of a narrow green valley. They were chatting gaily, and had just agreed that it was time to turn their horses' heads homeward, when a sudden darkening made them aware that one of the unexpected thunder-gusts peculiar to the region was upon them. They were still a mile above the village, but as no nearer place of shelter presented itself, they decided to proceed. But the storm moved more rapidly than they, and long before the first houses came into sight, the heavy drops began to pelt down. A brown young fellow, lying flat on his back under a thick bush, with his horse standing over him, shouted to them to try the cave, waving his hand in its direction, and hurrying on they saw in another moment a shelving brow of rock in the cliff, under which was a deep recess. To this Clarence directed the horses. He lifted Clover down. She half sat, half leaned on the slope of the rock, well under cover, while he stretched himself at full length on a higher ledge, and held the bridles fast. The horses' heads and the saddles were fairly well protected, but the hindquarters of the animals were presently streaming with water. "'This isn't half bad, is it?' Clarence said. His mouth was so close to Clover's ear that she could catch his words in spite of the noisy thunder and the roar of the descending rain. "'No, I call it fun.' "'You look awfully pretty, do you know?' was the next and very unexpected remark. "'Nonsense! Not nonsense at all!' At that moment a carriage dashed rapidly by, the driver guiding the horses as well as he could between the points of an umbrella which constantly menaced his eyes. Other travellers in the pass had evidently been surprised by the storm besides themselves. The lady who held the umbrella looked out, and caught the picture of the group under the cliff. It was a suggestive one. Clover's hat was a little pushed forward by the rock against which she leaned, which in its turn pushed forward the waving rings of hair which shaded her forehead, but did not hide her laughing eyes or the dimples in her pink cheeks. The fair, slender girl, the dark, stalwart young fellow so close to her, the rain, the half-sheltered horses— it was easy enough to construct a little romance. The lady evidently did so. It was what photographers call an instantaneous effect, caught in three seconds, as the carriage whirled past. But in that fraction of a minute, the lady had nodded and flashed a brilliant, sympathetic smile in their direction. And Clover had nodded in return and laughed back. A good many people seem to have been caught as we have, she said as another streaming vehicle dashed by. "'I wish it would rain for a week,' observed Clarence. "'My gracious, what a wish! What would become of us if it did?' "'We should stay here just where we are, and I should have you all to myself for once, and nobody could come in to interfere with me.' "'Thank you extremely! How hungry we should be! How could you be so absurd, Clarence?' "'I'm not absurd at all. I'm perfectly in earnest.' "'Do you mean that you really want to stay a week under this rock with nothing to eat?' "'Well, no. Not exactly that, perhaps. Though if you could, I would. But I mean that I would like to get you for a whole solid week to myself. There is such a gang of people about always, and they all want you. "'Clover,' he went on, for, puzzled at his tone, she made no answer, couldn't you like me a little? I like you a great deal. You come next to Phil and Dorry with me. Hang Phil and Dorry! Who wants to come next to them? I want you to like me a great deal more than that. I want you to love me. Couldn't you, Clover? 
How strangely you talk. I do love you, of course. You're my cousin. I don't care to be loved, of course. I want to be loved for myself. Clover, you know what I mean. You must know. I can afford to marry now. Won't you stay in Colorado and be my wife? I don't think you know what you are saying, Clarence. I am older than you are. I thought you looked upon me as a sort of mother or older sister. Only fifteen months older, retorted Clarence. I never heard of anyone's being a mother at that age. I'm a man now, I would have you remember, though I am a little younger than you, and know my mind as well as if I were fifty. Dear Clovy, coaxingly, couldn't you? You liked the High Valley, didn't you? I'd do anything possible to make it nice and pleasant for you. I do like the High Valley very much, said Clover, still with the feeling that Clarence must be half in joke, or she half in dream. But, my dear boy, it isn't my home. I couldn't leave Papa and the children and stay out here, even with you. It would seem so strange and far away. You could if you cared for me, replied Clarence dejectedly. Clover's kind, argumentative, elder sisterly tone was precisely that which is most discouraging to a lover. Oh dear, cried poor Clover, not far from tears herself, this is dreadful. What? moodily. Having an offer? You must have had lots of them before now. Indeed, I never did. People don't do such things in Burnett. Please don't say any more, Clarence. I'm very fond of you, just as I am of the boys, but... But what? Go on. How can I? Clover was fairly crying. You mean that you can't love me in the other way? Yes. The word came out half as a sob, but the sincerity of the accent was unmistakable. Well said poor Clarence, after a long, bitter pause. It isn't your fault, I suppose. I'm not good enough for you. Still, I'd have done my best if you would have taken me, Clover. I'm sure you would, eagerly. You've always been my favourite cousin, you know. People can't make themselves care for each other. It has to come in spite of them, or not at all. At least, that is what the novels say. But you're not angry with me, are you, dear? We will be good friends always, shan't we? Persuasively. I wonder if we can, said Clarence in a hopeless tone. It doesn't seem likely, but I don't know any more about it than you do. It's my first offer as well as yours. Then, after a silence and a struggle, he added in a more manful tone, We'll try for it at least. I can't afford to give you up. You're the sweetest girl in the world. I always said so, and I say so still. It will be hard at first, but perhaps it may grow easier with time. Oh, it will, cried Clover hopefully. It's only because you're so lonely out here, and see so few people, that makes you suppose I am better than the rest. One of these days you'll find a girl who is a great deal nicer than I am, and then you'll be glad that I didn't say yes. There! The rain is just stopping. It's easy enough to talk, remarked Clarence gloomily, as he gathered up the bridles of the horses. But I shall do nothing of the kind. I declare I won't. End of chapter 9「ゆうきのおとつきの」「ゆうきのおとつきのおとつきのおとつきのおとつきのおとつきのおと and would show it in his manner, and she disliked very much the idea that Phil might suspect the reason, or worse still, Mr. Templestowe. But when he finally appeared, he seemed much the same as usual. After all, she reflected, 
it had only been a boyish impulse he has already got over it or not meant all he said in this she did clarence an injustice he had been very much in earnest when he spoke and it showed the good stuff which was in him and his real regard for clover that he should be making so manly a struggle with his disappointment and pain his life had been a lonely one in colorado he could not afford to quarrel with his favourite cousin, and with him, as with other lovers, there may have been, besides, some lurking hope that she might yet change her mind. But perhaps Clover in a measure was right in her conviction that Clarence was still too young and undeveloped to have things go very deep with him. He seemed to her in many ways as boyish and as undisciplined as Phil. With early September the summering of the Ute Park came to a close. The cold begins early at that elevation, and light frosts and red leaves warned the dwellers in tents and cabins to flee. Clover made her preparations for departure with real reluctance. She had grown very fond of the place, but Phil was perfectly himself again, and there seemed no reason for their staying longer. So back to St. Helens they went and to Mrs. Marsh, who, in reply to Clover's letter, had written that she must make room for them somehow, though for the life of her she couldn't say how. It proved to be in two small back rooms. An eruption of eastern invalids had filled the house to overflowing, and new faces met them at every turn. Two or three of the last summer's inmates had died during their stay, one of them the very sick man whose room Mrs. Watson had coveted. His death took place, as if on purpose, she told Clover, the very week after her removal to the Shoshone. Mrs. Watson herself was preparing for return to the East. I've seen the West now, she said, all I want to see, and I'm quite ready to go back to my own part of the country. Ellen writes that she thinks I'd better start for home so as to get settled before the cold. And it's so cold here I can't realise that they're still in the middle of peaches at home. Ellen always spices are great. They're better than preserves. And as for the canned ones, why, peaches and water is what I call them. Well, my dear, distance lends enchantment, and Clover had become my dear again. I'm glad I could come out and help you along, and now that you know so many people here, you won't need me so much as you did at first. I shall tell Mrs. Perkins to write to Mrs. Hall to tell your father how well your brother is looking, and I know he'll be... And here's a little handkerchief for a keepsake. It was a pretty handkerchief of pale yellow silk with embroidered corners, and Clover kissed the old lady as she thanked her, and they parted good friends but their intercourse had led her to make certain firm resolutions. I will try to keep my mind clear and my talk clear, to learn what I want and what I have a right to want and what I mean to say, so as not to puzzle and worry people when I grow old, by being vague and helpless and fussy, she reflected. I suppose if I don't form the habit now, I shan't be able to then and it would be dreadful to end by being like poor Mrs. Watson. Altogether, Mrs. Marsh's house had lost its home-like character, and it was not strange that under the circumstances Phil should flag a little. He was not ill, but he was out of sorts and dismal, and disposed to consider the presence of so many strangers as a personal wrong. Clover felt that it was not a good atmosphere for him, and anxiously revolved in her mind what was best to do. The Shoshone was much too expensive. Good boarding houses in St. Helens were few and far between, and all of them shared in a still greater degree the disadvantages which had made themselves felt at Mrs. Marsh's. The solution to her puzzle came, as solutions often do, unexpectedly. She was walking down Paiute Street on her way to call on Alice Blanchard, when her attention was attracted to a small, shut-up house, on which was a sign, number 13, to let, furnished. The sign was not printed, but written on a half-sheet of foolscap, 
which was what led Clover to notice it. She studied the house a while, then opened the gate and went in. Two or three steps led to a little piazza. She seated herself on the top step and tried to peep in at the closed blinds of the nearest window. While she was doing so, a woman with a shawl over her head came hastily down a narrow side street or alley and approached her. "'Oh, did you want the key?' she said. "'The key?' replied Clover, surprised. "'Of this house, do you mean?' "'Yes. Miss Starkey left it with me when she went away because she said it was handy, and I could give it to anybody who wished to look at the place. You're the first that has come, so when I see you sitting here, I just ran over. Did Mr. Belloy send you?' "'No, nobody sent me. Is it Mr. Belloy who has the letting of the house?' "'Yes.' "'But I can let folks in. "'I told Miss Starkey I'd air and dust a little now and then, "'if it wasn't took. "'Poor soul! "'She was anxious enough about it, "'and it all had to be done on a sudden, "'and she in such a heap of trouble "'that she didn't know which way to turn. "'It was just lock up and go.' "'Tell me about her,' said Clover, "'making room on the step for the woman to sit down. "'Well, she come out last year with her man "'who had lung trouble.' and he wasn't no better at first, and then he seemed to pick up for a while, and they took this house and fixed themselves to stay for a year at least. They made it real nice too, and slicked up considerable. Miss Starkey said, said she, I don't want to spend no more money on it than I can help, but Mr. Starkey must be made comfortable. Says she, them was her very words. He used to set out on this stoop all day long in the summer, and she alongside him except when she had to be indoors doing the work. She didn't keep no regular help. I did the washing for her, and come in now and then for a day to clean, so she managed very well. Then, Wednesday before last it was, he had a bleeding, and sank away like all in a minute, and was gone before the doctor could be had. Miss Starkey was all stunned like with the shock of it, and before she had got her mind cleared up so as to order about anything, "'Come a telegraph to say her son was down with diphtheria, "'and his wife with a young baby, and both was very low. "'And between one and the other, she was pretty near out of her wits. "'We packed her up as quick as we could, and he was sent off by express. "'And she says to me, "'Miss Kenny, you see how it is? "'I've got this house on my hands till May. "'There's no time to see to anything, and I've got no heart to care.' But if any one'll take it for the winter, well and good, and I'll leave the sheets and tablecloths and everything in it, because it may make a difference, and I don't mind about them no how. And if no one does take it, I'll just have to bear the loss, says she. Poor soul, she was in a world of trouble, surely. Do you know what rent she asks for the house? said Clover, in whose mind a vague plan was beginning to take shape. Twenty-five a month was what she paid, and she said she'd throw the furniture in for the rest of the time, just to get rid of the rent. Clover reflected. Twenty-five dollars a week was what they were paying at Mrs. Marsh's. Could they take this house and live on the same sum, after deducting the rent, and perhaps get this good-natured-looking woman to come in for a certain number of hours and help do the work? She almost fancied that they could if they kept no regular servant. "'I think I would like to see the house,' she said at last, after a silent calculation and a scrutinising look at Mrs. Kenny, who was a faded, wiry, but withal kindly-looking person, shrewd and clean, a North of Ireland Protestant, as she afterward told Clover. In fact, her accent was rather Scotch than Irish. They went in. The front door opened into a minute hall, from which another door led into a back hall with a staircase. There was a tiny sitting-room, an equally tiny dining-room, a small kitchen, and above, two bedrooms, and a sort of unplastered space, which would answer to put trunks in. That was all, save a little woodshed. Everything was bare and scanty, and rather particularly ugly. The sitting-room had a frightful paper of mingled mustard and molasses tint, and a matted floor, 
but there was a good-sized open fireplace for the burning of wood, in which two bricks did duty for andirons, three or four splint and cane-bottom chairs, a lounge and a table, while the pipe of the large morning glory stove in the dining-room expanded into a sort of drum in the chamber above. This secured a warm sleeping-place for Phil. Clover began to think that they could make it do. Mrs. Kenny, who evidently considered the house as a wonder of luxury and convenience, opened various cupboards and pointed admiringly to the glass and china, the kitchen tins and utensils, and the cotton sheets and pillowcases, which they respectively held. "'There's water laid on,' she said. "'You don't have to pump any. Here's the wash-tubs in the shed. "'That's a real nice tin boiler for the clothes. I never seen a nicer. "'Miss Starkey had that heater in the dining-room set the very week before she went away. "'Winter's coming on,' she says, "'and I must see about keeping my husband warm.' "'Never thinking, poor thing, how twas to be.' "'Does this chimney draw?' asked the practical Clover. "'And does the kitchen stove bake well?' First rate. "'I've seen Miss Darkey take her biscuits out many a time, "'as nice a brown as ever you'd want, "'and the chimney don't smoke a mite. "'They kept a wood fire here in May most all the time, so I know.' Clover thought the matter over for a day or two consulted with Dr. Hope, and finally decided to try the experiment. Number 13 was taken, and Mrs. Kenny engaged for two days' work each week, with such other occasional assistance as Clover might require. She was a widow, it seemed, with one son, who, being employed on the railroad, only came home for the nights. She was glad of a regular engagement, and proved an excellent stand-by and a great help to Clover, to whom she had taken a fancy from the start, and many were the good turns which she did for love rather than hire, for my little miss, as she called her. To Phil, the plan seemed altogether delightful. This was natural, as all the fun fell to his share and none of the trouble, a fact of which Mrs. Hope occasionally reminded him. Clover persisted, however, that it was all fair, and that she got lots of fun out of it too, and didn't mind the trouble. The house was so absurdly small that it seemed to strike everyone as a good joke, and Clover's friends set themselves to help in the preparations, as if the establishment in Paiute Street were a kind of baby house about which they could amuse themselves at will. It is a temptation always to make a house pretty, but Clover felt herself on honour to spend no more than was necessary. Papa had trusted her, and she was resolved to justify his trust. So she bravely withstood her desire for several things which would have been great improvements, so far as looks went, and confined her purchases to articles of clear necessity. Extra blankets, a bedside carpet for Phil's room, and a chafing dish over which she could prepare little impromptu dishes and so save fuel and fatigue. She allowed herself some cheap madras curtains for the parlour and a few yards of deep red flannel to cover sundry shelves and corner brackets which Geoffrey Templestowe, who had a turn for carpentry, put up for her. Various loans and gifts, too, appeared from friendly attics and storerooms to help out. Mrs. Hope hunted up some old iron fire-dogs and a pair of bellows. Poppy contributed a pair of brass-knobbed tongs, and Mrs. Marsh lent her a lamp. Number 13 began to look attractive. They were nearly ready, but not yet moved in, when one day, as Clover stood in the queer little parlour, contemplating the effect of Jeff's last effort, an extra pine shelf, above the narrow mantel-shelf, a pair of arms stole round her waist, and a cheek which had a sweet familiarity about it was pressed against hers. She turned, and gave a great shriek of amazement and joy, for it was her sister Katie's arms that held her. Beyond, in the doorway, were Mrs. Ash and Amy, with Phil between them. "'Is it you? Is it really you?' 
cried Clover, laughing and sobbing all at once in her happy excitement. How did it happen? I never knew you were coming. Neither did we. It all happened suddenly, explained Katie. The ship was ordered to New York on three days' notice, and as soon as Ned sailed, Polly and I made haste to follow. There would have been just time to get a letter here if we had written at once. But I had the fancy to give you a surprise. Oh, it is such a nice surprise. But when did you come, and where are you? At the Shoshone house. At least our bags are there. But we only stayed a minute. We were in such a hurry to get to you. We went to Mrs. Marsh's and found Phil, who brought us here. Have you really taken this funny little house, as Phil tells us? We really have. Oh, what a comfort it will be to tell you all about it, and have you say if I have done right. Dear, dear Katie, I feel as if home had just arrived by train. And Polly, too. You all look so well, and as if California had agreed with you. Amy has grown so that I should scarcely have known her. Four delightful days followed. Katie flung herself into all Clover's plans, with the full warmth of sisterly interest, and though the hopes and other kind friends made many hospitable overtures, and would gladly have turned her short visit into a continuous fate, she persisted in keeping the main part of her time free. She must see a little of St. Helens, she declared, so as to be able to tell her father about it, and she must help Clover to get to housekeeping. These were the important things, and nothing else must interfere with them. Most effectual assistance did she render in the way of unpacking and arranging. More than that, one day, when Clover, rather to her own disgust, had been made to go with Polly and Amy to Denver, while Katie stayed behind, lo, on her return, a transformation had taken place, and the ugly paper in the parlour of number 13 was found replaced with one of warm, sunny, gold-brown. "'Oh, why did you?' cried Clover. "'It's only for a few months, and the other would have answered perfectly well. Why did you, Katie?' "'I suppose it was foolish,' Katie admitted. "'But somehow I couldn't bear to have you sitting opposite that deplorable, mustard-coloured thing all winter long. "'And really and truly it hardly cost anything. "'It was a remnant reduced to ten cents a roll. "'The whole thing was less than four dollars. "'You can call it your Christmas present from me, if you like. "'And I shall play, besides, that the other paper had arsenic in it. "'I'm sure it looked as if it had.' and corrosive sublimate, too. Clover laughed outright. It was so funny to hear Katie's fertility of excuse. You dear, ridiculous darling, she said, giving her sister a good hug. It was just like you, and though I scold, I am perfectly delighted. I did hate that paper with all my heart, and this is lovely. It makes the room look like a different thing. Other benefactions followed. Polly, it appeared, had bought more Indian curiosities in Denver than she knew what to do with, and begged permission to leave a big bear skin and two wolf skins with clover for the winter, and a splendid striped Navajo blanket as a portiere to keep off draughts from the entry. Katie had set herself up in California blankets while they were in San Francisco, and she now insisted on leaving a pair behind and loaning Clover besides one of two beautiful Japanese silk pictures which Ned had given her, and which made a fine spot of colour on the pretty new wall. There were presents in her trunks for all at home, and Ned had sent Clover a beautiful lacquered box. Somehow Clover seemed like a new and doubly interesting Clover to Katie. She was struck by the self-reliance which had grown upon her, by her bright ways and the capacity and judgment which all her arrangements exhibited, and she listened with delight to Mrs. Hope's praises of her sister. She really is a wonderful little creature, so wise and judgmatical, and yet so pretty and full of fun. 
people are quite cracked about her out here. I don't think you'll ever get her back at the East again, Mrs. Worthington. There seems a strong determination on the part of several persons to keep her here. What do you mean? But Mrs. Hope, who believed in the old proverb about not addling eggs by meddling with them prematurely, refused to say another word. Clover, when questioned, could not imagine what Mrs. Hope meant, and Katie had to go away with her curiosity unsatisfied. Clarence came in once while she was there, but she did not see Mr. Templestowe. Katie's last gift to Clover was a pretty teapot of Japanese ware. "'I meant it for Cece,' she explained, "'but as you have none, I'll give it to you instead, "'and take her the fan I meant for you. "'It seems more appropriate.' Phil and Clover moved into number 13 the day before the Eastern party left, so as to be able to celebrate the occasion by having them all to an impromptu housewarming. There was not much to eat, and things were still a little unsettled, but Clover scrambled some eggs on her little blazer for them, the newly lit fire burned cheerfully, and a good deal of quiet fun went on about it. Amy was so charmed with the minute establishment that she declared she meant to have one exactly like it for Mabel, whenever she got married. "'And a spirit lamp, too, just like Clover's, and a cunning teeny-weeny kitchen,' and a stove to boil things on. Mamma, when shall I be old enough to have a house all of my own? Not till you're tired of playing with dolls, I'm afraid. Well, that will be never. If I thought I ever could be tired of Mabel, I should be so ashamed of myself that I should not know what to do. You oughtn't to say such things, Mamma. She might hear you too, and have her feelings hurt. Oh, please don't call her that, said Amy who had as strong an objection to the word doll as mice are said to have to the word cat. Next morning, the dear home people proceeded on their way, and Clover fell to work resolutely on her housekeeping, glad to keep busy, for she had a little fear of being homesick for Katie. Every small odd and end that she had brought with her from Burnett came into play now. The photographs were pinned on the wall, the few books and ornaments took their places on the extemporised shelves and on the table, which, thanks to Mrs. Hope, was no longer bare, but hidden by a big square of red canton flannel. There was almost always a little bunch of flowers from the Wade greenhouses, which were supposed to come from Mrs. Wade, and altogether the effect was cosy, and the little interior looked absolutely pretty, though the result was attained by such very simple means. Phil thought it heavenly to be by themselves and out of the reach of strangers. Everything tasted delicious. All the arrangements pleased him. Never was boy so easily suited as he for those first few weeks at number 13. You're awfully good to me, Clover, he said one night rather suddenly from the depths of his rocking chair. The remark was so little in Phil's line that it quite made her jump. "'Why, Phil, what made you say that?' she asked. "'Oh, I don't know. I was thinking about it. We used to call Katie the nicest, but you're just as good as she is.' This Clover justly considered a tremendous compliment. "'You always make a fellow feel like home, as Jeff Templestowe says.' "'Did Jeff say that?' with a warm sense of gladness at her heart. How nice of him. What made him say it? Oh, I don't know. It was up in the canyon one day when we got to talking, replied Phil. There are no flies on you, he considers. I asked him once if he didn't think Miss Chase pretty, and he said, not half so pretty as you were. Really? You seem to have been very confidential. And what is that about flies? Phil, Phil, you really mustn't use such slang. I suppose it is slang, but it's an awfully nice expression anyway. But what does it mean? Oh, you must see just by the sound of it what it means, that there's no nonsense sticking out all over you like some of the girls. It's a great compliment. Is it? Well, I'm glad to know. But Mr. Templestowe never used such a phrase, I'm sure. 
"'No, he didn't,' admitted Phil. "'But that's what he meant.' So the winter drew on, the strange, beautiful Colorado winter, with weeks of golden sunshine broken by occasional storms of wind and sand, or by scurries of snow which made the plains white for a few hours and then vanished, leaving them dry and firm as before. The nights were often cold, so cold that comfortables and blankets seemed all too few, and Clover roused with a shiver to think that presently it would be her duty to get up and start the fires, so that Phil might find a warm house when he came downstairs. Then, before she knew it, fires would seem oppressive, first one window and then another would be thrown up, and Phil would be sitting on the piazza in the balmy sunshine, as comfortable as on a June morning at home. It was a wonderful climate, and as Clover wrote her father, the winter was better even than the summer, and was certainly doing Phil more good. He was able to spend hours every day in the open air, walking or riding Dr. Hope's horse, and improved steadily. Clover felt very happy about him. This early rising and fire-making were the hardest things she had to encounter, though all the housekeeping proved more onerous than, in her inexperience, she had expected it to be. After the first week or two, however, she managed very well, and gradually learned the little labour-saving ways which can only be learned by actual experiment. Getting breakfast and tea she enjoyed, for they could be chiefly managed by the use of the chafing dish. Dinners were more difficult, till she hit on the happy idea of having Mrs. Kenny roast a big piece of beef or mutton, or a pair of fowls, every Monday. These pièces de résistance, in their different stages of hot, cold, and warmed over, carried them well along through the week, and supplemented with an occasional chop or steak, served very well. Fairly good soups could be bought in tins, which needed only to be seasoned and heated for use on table. Oysters were easily procurable there, as everywhere in the West. Good brown bread and rolls came from the bakery, and Clover developed a hitherto dormant talent for cookery, and the making of graham gems, corn dodgers, hoe cakes baked on a barrel head before the parlour fire, and wonderful little flaky biscuits raised all in a minute with royal baking powder. She also became expert in that other fine art of condensing work and making it move in easy grooves. Her tea things she washed with her breakfast things, just setting the cups and plates in the sink for the night, pouring a dipper full of boiling water over them. There was no silver to care for, no delicate glass or valuable china. The very simplicity of apparatus made the house an easy one to keep. Clover was kept busy, for simplify as you will, providing for the daily needs of two persons does take time, but she liked her cares and rarely felt tired. The elastic and vigorous air seemed to build up her forces from moment to moment, and each day's fatigues were more than repaired by each night's rest, which is the balance of true health in living. Little pleasures came from time to time. Christmas Day they spent with the Hopes, who from first to last proved the kindest and most helpful of friends to them. The young men from the High Valley were there also, and the day was brightly kept, from the home letters by the early mail to the grand merry-making and dance with which it wound up. Everybody had some little present for everybody else. Mrs. Wade sent Clover a tall India rubber plant in a china pot, which made a spire of green in the south window for the rest of the winter. And Clover had spent many odd moments and stitches in the fabrication of a gorgeous Mexican-worked sideboard cloth for the Hopes. But of all Clover's offerings, the one which pleased her most, as showing a close observation of her needs, came from Jeff Templestowe. It was a prosaic gift, being a wagon-load of pinion wood for the fire, but the gnarled, oddly twisted sticks were heaped high with pine boughs and long trails of red-fruited kinnikinnick to serve as a Christmas dressing, 
and somehow the gift gave Clover a peculiar pleasure. "'How dear of him,' she thought, lifting one of the big pinion logs with a gentle touch, "'and how like him to think of it. I wonder what makes him so different from other people. He never says fine, flourishing things like Thurber Wade, or abrupt, rather rude things like Clarence, or inconsiderate things like Phil, or satirical funny things like the doctor. But he is always doing something kind. He's a little bit like Papa, I think, and yet I don't know. I wish Katie could have seen him. Life at St. Helens in the winter season is never dull, but the gayest fortnight of all was when, late in January, the High Valley partners deserted their duties and came in for a visit to the Hopes. All sorts of small festivities had been saved for this special fortnight, and among the rest, Clover and Phil gave a party. "'If you can squeeze into the dining-room, and if you can do with just cream toast for tea,' she explained, "'it would be such fun to have you come. I can't give you anything to eat to speak of, because I haven't any cook, you know. But you can all eat a great deal of dinner, and then you won't starve.' Thurber weighed, the hopes— Clarence, Jeff, Marion, and Alice made a party of nine, and it was hard work indeed to squeeze so many into the tiny dining room of number thirteen. The very difficulties, however, made it all the jollier. Clover's cream toast, which she prepared before their eyes on the blazer, her little tarts made of crackers split, buttered, and toasted brown with a spoonful of raspberry jam in each, and the big loaf of hot gingerbread to be eaten with thick cream from the high valley, were pronounced each in its way to be absolute perfection. Clarence and Phil kindly volunteered to shunt the dishes into the kitchen after the repast was concluded, and they gathered round the fire to play twenty questions and stagecoach, and all manner of what Clover called lead-pencil games, crambo and criticism, and anagrams, and consequences. There was immense laughter over some of these as, for instance, when Dr. Hope was reported as having met Mrs. Watson in the North Cheyenne Canyon, and he said that knowledge is power, and she, that when larks flew round ready roasted, poor folks could stick a fork in, and the consequence was that they eloped together to a cannibal island, where each suffered a process of disillusionation and the world said it was the natural result of osculation. This last sentence was Phil's, and I feared he had peeped a little, or his context would not have been so apropos. But altogether, the cream toast soiree, as he called it, was a pronounced success. It was not long after this that a mysterious little cloud of difference seemed to fall on Thurber Wade. He ceased to call at number 13, or to bring flowers from his mother, and by and by it was learned that he had started for a visit to the east. No one knew what had caused these phenomena, though some people may have suspected. Later it was announced that he was in Chicago, and very attentive to a pretty Miss Somebody, whose father had made a great deal of money in Standard Oil. Poppy arched her brows, and made great amused eyes at Clover, trying to entangle her into admissions as to this or that, and Clarence experimented in the same direction. But Clover was innocently impervious to these efforts, and no one ever knew what had happened between her and Thurber, if, indeed, anything had happened. So May came to St. Helens in due course of time. The sandstorms and the snowstorms were things of the past, the tawny yellow of the plains began to flush with green, and every day the sun grew more warm and beautiful. Phil seemed perfectly well and sound now. Their occupancy of number 13 was drawing to a close, and Clover, as she reflected that Colorado would soon be a thing of the past and must be left behind, was sensible of a little sinking of the heart, even though she and Phil were going home. End of chapter 10